during our uh, bit of a delay. And uh, thank you to our commissioners and the public for also tuning in. So we're gonna, this is uh, Commissioner Chair Bell, and I will now call to order the Metro Historic Zoning Commission meeting of September the 16th, 2020. Um, out of the abundance of caution and pursuant to recommendations from federal, state, and local health, health agencies regarding avoiding group gatherings due to the COVID-19 coronavirus, this meeting is a teleconference meeting. Advanced public comments were possible through email, mail, and voicemail. And we will also take live comments via phone. And that number is 629-255-1911. That'll be on screen also later on. However, please do not call until the project you wish to speak about is announced. Also just want to remind everyone to be sure you are uh, on your side, you are muted uh, unless you are um, recognized to speak so that we don't hear background um, noise as well. I will now take roll call of the commissioners in attendance. And when I say your name, please say present. Vice Chair Stewart. Present. Commissioner Fitz. We'll come back. Commissioner Johnson. Present. Commissioner Jones. Present. Commissioner Mayhall. We'll come back to that. Commissioner Price. Present. And Commissioner Williams. Present. Thank you, sir. We will welcome you to um, as, as our new commissioner and um, we are honored to have you join our commission. So thank you very much. Thank you, it's a pleasure to serve. Say that again, sir. Thank you, it's a pleasure to serve. Yes, sir, thank you. So the commissioner, the commission must vote on the record that the COVID-19 pandemic requires us to hold a telephonic meeting as permitted under the governor's executive order number 16. And we do, I am taking a motion to hold this electronic meeting. So commissioners, yes, Vice Chair Stewart. Um, I move that the meeting agenda constitutes essential business of this body and meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Thank you, and do I have a second? Vice Chair Price. I mean, second. Commissioner Price, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> second. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. And all in favor? Do we raise hands on that? I forget. Um, Madam Chair, you'll need to do a roll call then. Oh yes, that's right. Thank you. I feel like I should know this by now, but um, thank you again after six WebExes. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, I'll take the roll call for the motion. Um, thank you, Mr. Dickerson. <clears throat> so when I say your name, please say yes or no. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz, I think she's still not online, all right. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Okay, she is still not online. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. So we do have quorum. Okay. All right, pursuant to the provision of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, no, notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County via a statutory writ of certiorari. You are advised to seek your own independent 
legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. For each case, there will be a public hearing. We ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes and they may reserve two minutes as a rebuttal of public comment. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they have previously requested in writing for five minutes as a representative of a group or organization. We have not received any such requests for this meeting. During the public hearing, staff will first read any comments received in writing and no voicemails were received. And finally, members of the public calling in will be heard. Ms. Ziegler, are there any proposed changes to the agenda? Yes, we would ask that the design guideline consolidation project be deferred um, and applicants for 4909 Elkins and 1501 Lillian have both requested a deferral. Okay, thank you. Is there any discussion about that revision? If so, please raise your hand, commissioners. And I do not see any raised hands. Okay, uh, we'll need a motion. Uh, Madam, Chairman, uh, Madam Chairman, this is Vice Chair Stewart. I so move. Okay. Is there a second to the motion? Commissioner Jones. Yes, Commissioner Jones, I second the motion. Okay. Anyone have any comments? All right. I will take the roll call. Seeing no hands. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Okay, Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall. Commissioner Price. Yes. And Commissioner Williams. Yes. Okay, thank you. And before we begin with the first case, Ms. Ziegler, are there any council members who wish to speak? No, council member Withers has sent some written comment, but I can read those with those specific cases. Okay. Now is the time for the public to call in if someone would like an item removed from the consent agenda by calling the number on the screen, which is 629-255-1911. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. Items removed from the consent agenda will be moved to the end of the agenda. First, Ms. Sargent will read the cases proposed for the consent agenda, and then I will ask if anyone would like to have any item removed for discussion. All right, the first item on the consent agenda uh, is approval of the administrative permits issued for the month. An addition and outbuilding are proposed at 1112 Basketball Street. The owners of 1101 Paris Avenue have requested an addition and setback determination. 1807 Russell Street requests a setback determination for a previously approved project. And the owners of 2404 Belmont Boulevard are requesting an addition and outbuilding. Staff recommends approving these projects along with their applicable conditions as noted in the staff reports. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sajit. Um, our are there any requests to remove an item from consent? Okay, do not see any of our commissioners or call in raising hands. Okay. Robin, have we received any requests over the phone? We have not. Okay. Okay, seeing no hands or call ins, I see Vice Chair Stewart's hand is raised. Uh, Madam Chairman, I move to uh, adopt the consent agenda. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Commissioner Price. Second. Okay. 
There's a first, there's a second, and I will call the roll. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Okay, I still don't see her in. She's all right, Ms. Mayhall, Commissioner Mayhall, are you in? We possibly can't hear you. Okay. All right, uh, Commissioner Price. Yes. And Commissioner Williams. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Now is the time for anyone to call if they have public comment regarding the next project, which is 2516 Belmont Boulevard. The number is on the screen and also 629-255-1911. And Mr. Alexander will present the project. Uh, good afternoon. This is a show cause hearing for this case where the applicant can explain why the permit conditions could not be met and the entire permit should not be revoked. Uh, the case is an outbuilding at the rear of the lot that was approved in 2019. At that time, it was proposed as having a five foot setback from Sweetbriar Avenue. Uh, that would be less than the 10 foot setback required by the bulk zoning. Uh, the commission approved the outbuilding with conditions, one of which was that the building had to meet the 10 foot required setback from Sweetbriar Avenue. Uh, revised plans were submitted uh, showing the building meeting that 10 foot setback from Sweetbriar and a permit was issued in December of 2019. Uh, construction subsequently began and a framing inspection was done on July 31st. Uh, and in that inspection, staff observed that a balcony had been added onto the building, which was not shown on the plans. Um, the applicant has since supplied as-built drawings, which show that while the footprint of the building is 10 feet from the property line along Sweet Prior, the balcony encroaches into the 10 foot setback buffer. Staff verified with codes, the codes department that balconies are not permitted as setback encroachments, meaning the building has a six and a half foot setback where the commission required 10 feet. Um, additionally, uh, when the permit was issued in December of 20, 2019, staff did not notice that the footprint of the building had increased from 750 square feet to 785 square feet. Uh, because the outbuilding already exceeds the 750 square feet that the design guidelines allow, uh, that's another reason that staff finds that the additional 41 square feet of a balcony would not be appropriate. Uh, because the balcony encroaches into the uh, 10 foot setback and because the size exceeds what the guidelines allow, uh, staff recommends that the violation of the balcony be corrected to meet the previously approved plans and that the balcony uh, does not meet section 2B1I of the Belmont Hillsborough Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Uh, staff further recommends that the balcony should be removed within 60 days. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Um, I think the applicants are on the line and please raise your hand so that I may acknowledge that you are on the line. Okay. Um, I don't see any hands raised. Right here. Okay. Uh, when you do, please uh, announce who you are and you're the applicant or? Okay, are we ready? Can you see me? Uh, we will hear you. We are not on, we're not on video. Okay, just let okay. me know. 
just let me know when my time starts and I'd like to um, reserve whatever unused time I have for that rebuttal. Would be for rebuttal if there is one. Sure. Okay, and please announce who you are. Uh, my name is Blaine Bonadies, and I reside at 1606 Linden Avenue. I am representing Trey and Diane Smith, who reside at 2516 Belmont Boulevard. We are here today to show just cause to why the balcony of the outbuilding at 2516 Belmont should be allowed to remain as it is. The original proposal for the building in November of 2019 included a balcony which and was approved, along with a 10-foot side setback prescribed by the Historic Commission. So therefore, the balcony itself is not the issue before us. The issue rather is the new location of the balcony that would require just a three foot six inch reduction to the historic's requested 10 foot setback. As directly stated in the original submission in November 2019, the issue with a five foot setback was that public works was concerned that it would reduce sight line for motorists exiting the alley. However, the new location of the balcony does not impede or reduce these sight lines. We have confirmed this via email with Ben York at Public Works, who is the person that Sean consulted with, and they see no issue with the new balcony location. We have also verified via email with Clint Harper at Zoning that they have no issue with the reduction of the side setback and would defer to historic decision to vary from that bulk standard of 10 feet. Therefore, with all other concerned parties in agreement, we believe the commission should approve a reduction in side setback that would allow the balcony to remain. If we refer to the bulk zoning code and the neighborhood conservation code, they both have language which directly supports the reduction in the setback that we are requesting. If you look at 17.12.035 of the bulk zoning code, in reference to street setbacks within the UZO, it states, if it is a corner lot, which we are, street setbacks shall be consistent with the street setbacks of any pre-1950 building that previously occupied the same corner lot. That would be our building, which is pre-1950, which has an eight foot setback. If that information is not available, street setbacks shall be consistent with setbacks of any pre-1950 building located on any of the other corner lots at the same intersection. So those are the contextual lots that we're referring to in the code 17.12.035. In the Belmont Hillsborough Neighborhood Conservation Code, Roman numeral 2-2 on page 16 further states that outbuildings should be situated on a lot as historically typical for the surrounding historic buildings. Again, the context is those four lots at our intersection. Furthermore, the text clarifies this code and say, states, for corner lots, the DADU or outbuilding should match the context of homes on the street. If there is no context, which there is, the street shall set, shall, setback should be 10 feet. However, we do have contextual setbacks on the four corners. As the code states, the four lots at the intersection of Belmont and Sweetbar establish the context and determines the side street setbacks. The current conditions that we have at the four lots are as follows. At 2516, the principal structure is eight foot from the property line, that is our building. At 2511, across the street, we have um, a six foot setback um, at the, for the principal structure, and an outbuilding is also six feet from the Sweet Bar property line. At 2601, which is directly across the street as well, the principal structure is five feet from the Sweet Bar property line, according to the historic submission from 2013. Furthermore, the current outbuilding was replaced. In other words, we're referring to the pre-1950 outbuilding on that property, which was one foot from the property line, according to staff's findings in 2013, and it's in its public record. So we have an eight foot setback, a six foot setback, a five foot setback, and a one foot setback to refer to as far as determining what that contextual side street set, setback should be. 
and all of those do not denote 10 feet. If you take the average of those, you end up with about five foot setback, which is a contextual setback in the historic district on that intersection. The conclusions are, oh, 2600 um, across the street is, pre, is post 1950, so we don't refer to it as such. If the code supports, so the code supports a reduction up to five foot on the side street setback on Sweetbriar based on the surrounding context. And let us remember that we are not actually placing the footprint or mass of our building within the previously requested 10 foot setback. We are simply looking for a reduction of three foot six inches in setback to allow a projection that occurs on the second story. The balcony does not undermine the intention of the 10 foot setback as our balcony does not reduce the sight lines and still allows for safety of motorists and pedestrians at the intersection of Sweetwire and the alley. For these reasons, we ask that you allow the balcony to remain in its current state, approving a three foot six inch reduction to the 10 foot setback that Historic wants. Taken from code 1712060F.3, special setback regulations within the owning, owning urban zoning overlay, quote, the proposed building setback shall not create an adverse impact on adjacent properties, nor detract from a strong pedestrian friendly environment. We are doing neither of those, to the contrary. Taken from the 12 South detailed neighborhood design plan, I quote, it encourages a lively streetscape and buildings that are massed, scaled and oriented to create a pedestrian friendly environment. What you're looking at is a step out balcony, just enough room for a cafe chair and some potted plants. It provides Southern exposure, added light, warmth, fresh air, functionality and safety, all directives of the AIA ethical principles. It is simple, safe, protected, semi-private place that connects the public to the private with a humble architectural punctuation, which in its absence would create a bland and faceless street facade. Lastly, we have collected seven letters, letters of support for this project. I ask that you, not, that you not let the unique conditions of this project deter you from accepting what we have found to be fact and realize the mutual benefit of this proposal to the owner, the overlay and our community. We are asking for a compromise of three feet, six inches in reduction to the 10 foot prescription to, to allow um, to reduce it to six foot, six inches side setback, which is still one foot, six inches inside or greater than the contextual setback, which is five feet. The size of the building did not change from what was approved to what it is today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ms. Ziegler, do we have any public comment on this project? No, we do not have any comment and I don't see that we have any calls. Okay. Commissioners, do you have any question, questions for the applicant? Sure, you have your hand raised. Are are you just waving at us, or <laughs> do you have a comment? Sorry, I just didn't. I just didn't take it down. Sorry. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, I will close public hearing, and we will now go into commission deliberation. Okay, Vice uh, Commissioner Jones. Uh, sure, Commissioner Jones here. Um, I don't have a question for the applicant. I guess I have a question for Sean. Um, when or how exactly did the footprint increase? Um, I mean, I'm reading. I mean, you know, I read the staff report, but it was just a um, we approved with the conditions, of course, and then the next plan that they submitted to you, you know, to appease those conditions with the setback had a larger structure just kind of designed? Uh, yes. Uh, so the, the first of middle in November 2019, uh, the, the footprint was something like uh, 
22 feet by 36 feet uh, for 750 square feet total. Uh, the revision was 22 feet, four inches by 36, six inches or something like that. And, uh, and I sort of just uh, rounded the numbers in and a couple inches by a couple inches equals a couple square feet. So that's how it got from 750 to 785. It was my mistake. Oh, yeah, I mean, that, that happens. Um, again, this Commissioner Jones again. Um, I just go ahead and put my thoughts on this. Um, the applicant made a great presentation, um, but I have to uh, agree with staff. I personally agree with staff recommendation on this. Um, I don't believe we, again, upper story balconies on outbuildings are not common historically. So to me, it's even less about the setback than the fact that I don't think we would have approved this in the first place and they built it after the fact um, and are now asking permission. So I agree with staff and um, I think it should be uh, removed within 60 days. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Price. Yes, this is a question for the applicant. Um, why was the balcony not included on the plan submitted to the staff for the preservation permit? Applicant, Mr. Bonadies. Yes, I'd like, oh, there we go. I see now that I'm unmuted. <clears throat> you know, the original proposal had a, uh, had a balcony on it. Um, and when, when, we, when we built the building, the owner went up to the second floor and said, hey, what happened to our, what happened to our balcony? So I said, well, we, you know, it, it didn't make it back into the second provision. And she said, well, I want that. And, you know, there's one right down the alley from me that, that reminded me why I want mine. And I said, well, let me look into the setback issues and talk with public works and talk with, um, talk with uh, zoning and do my own research. And I come to find out that, you know, we're, we're in compliance with public works, which was their initial issue, which was we needed to set the building 10 feet back because um, of the sight line around that corner. Well, we didn't implicate that sight line whatsoever and we got permission from him that he, he had no issue with it. We also talked to uh, the, the, the codes and they said they had no issue with it. So we felt by right that we could build a balcony that's not within that setback um, because the setback really is erroneous because it shouldn't be 10 feet. It should be five feet based on the contextual setbacks, which was an error by the staff initially when they consulted with us to tell us where that building should go. And we're not implicating the footprint at all. We're still, we're still 10 feet back at the footprint. We're only talking about something that's, you know, at the second story. Okay, let's hold on there, applicant, um, Commissioner Johnson. I think uh, this is a question to the staff. Uh, if I'm reading uh, the staff uh, a report correctly, seems like first attachment is attachment A is uh, what uh, previously uh, this uh, commission approved as a plan. And uh, on that plan, I do not see any balcony, but however, uh, attachment B uh, uh, as planned as buildings, uh, shows uh, a balcony. So between, you know, our approved plan, uh, you know, attachment A to as built uh, a plan had happened, is any revision had happened? Uh, yes, this is Sean Alexander. Uh, the attachment A; uh, those are the plans that were uh, that were um, they were part of the permit that was issued in December 2019. Um, I did not include the November staff recommendation that showed a, a different design. It it had a balcony of sorts. I I mean it 
to me, I would have called it more of a terrace because it was not uh, projecting cantilevered like like the one uh, that we're discussing now. So it was a significant, substantial revision from the first recommendation to the permit. The permit being the drawings in attachment A. Uh, attachment B, uh, those actually reflect what has been constructed with a cantilevered balcony. Thank you for the clarification. So under the regular uh, course of business, uh, if the revision were to be significant from uh, what was originally permitted, uh, the applicant or you know, or owner, builder, whomever the case might be, have to resubmit the revision for us to uh, approve the revision or not and before uh, they start building. Uh, isn't it the regular course of uh, business? That is correct. Thank you, I appreciate that uh, clarification. Uh, thank you. Thank you, no Commissioner. Um, in, in addition, so let's just clarify, did the applicant come back to staff for this revision on attachment B? Uh, no, this was first noticed during a, a framing inspection. Uh, in July, the end of July. Uh, we had not seen plans uh, prior to that. Okay. Good for clarification. Commissioners, any other questions or discussion? Vice Chair Stewart? Um, so uh, a question for staff, uh, the applicant in their presentation mentioned correspondence between uh, Metro Public Works and between uh, letters of support from neighbors. Uh, did, did we receive any of that uh, input? Uh, I was copied on, an, on the email from Public Works. Um, that um, uh, and then include drawings that Public Works saw that actually they saw before before they were provided to us. Uh, and in that email, Ben York did say that they didn't have an issue with the, the balcony in terms of sight lines. Um, I forwarded that email to Lisa Butler in the codes department uh, for clarification uh, because well, as my understanding, which Lisa verified, uh, my understanding is that while codes, public works did not have an issue with it, they actually are also not the determinants of setbacks. Uh, so I asked her what the setbacks were, um, sort of irrespective of, of public works is uh, having an issue or not. She verified that the setback is 10 feet, setback, setback requirement per bulk zoning is 10 feet, and the balconies are not permitted as setback encroachments. Uh, as to the correspondence with uh, the codes department, Clint Harper, I mean, I, I don't dispute that either. They would not have an issue with the setback because it's in a historic zoning overlay it's or conservation overlay. It's, it's not their purview any longer. It essentially uh, defaults to historic zoning commission to determine. Uh, and I've not gotten copies or, or seen any of uh, letters of support or opposition from neighbors. All right, thank you. So let's, um, this is Commissioner uh, Chair, and reading the recommendation summary that the balcony does not meet section 2B1I of the Belmont Hillsborough Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Could we just have a moment to uh, Read that or bring that up or read it, either one. Uh, let's. Um, 2B1I is outbuildings. Um, 
Sorry, scrolling through. Uh, is that under new construction? It, w it is, yes. Okay. Which is um, packet there? 2B1I uh, and then sub parentheses 2. Outbuildings should be located on a lot as is historically typical for surrounding historic outbuildings. Um, uh, there are a few italicized sections under there. Uh, for the rear setback, maybe up to three feet from the rear property line for corner lots. The data or outbuilding should match the context of homes on the street. If there's no context, the street setback shall be a minimum of 10 feet. Okay. Commissioner Price. Yes, uh, in my own reading, uh, I think maybe even sub parentheses one may be more relevant um, in that a new garage or storage outbuilding should reflect the character of the period of the house to which the outbuilding will be related. The outbuilding should be compatible by not contrasting greatly with surrounding historic outbuildings, which to me speaks to the staff recommendation to disapprove because historically balconies like this were not found on outbuildings and we do not approve them as such. So circling back to Commissioner Jones's comments, I'm inclined to support the staff recommendation for uh, disapproval. Thank you. Any other comments or a motion? Commissioners, Commissioner Price. I move to approve the staff rep staff recommendation to uh, that the violation be corrected. There's a motion, Commissioner Jones. Second that motion. Okay, there is a first and a second, and I will take roll call. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay. That was a unanimous vote, so thank you. And we will move on to the next. Now it's the time for the public to call if uh, any comments regarding the next project, which is 1514 Clayton Avenue. The number is on screen and also 629-255-1911. Ms. Sajit will be our presenter. Yes, so staff has ordered a show cause hearing for materials on an infill project. Um, brick was installed on the infill at 1514 Clayton Avenue without prior review as required by the commission's conditions for approval. Um, the applicant is required to appear before the commission and show cause as to why the work should be allowed to remain as is rather than corrected. Next slide, please. It's typical that um, MHCC includes conditions of approval for materials that are unknown at the time of project approval the condition that a brick sample be approved prior to purchase and installation was included in the staff recommendation that was adopted by the commission um, and was also reiterated on the notes included in the preservation permit. Next slide, please. The brick is located on the foundation, front porch columns and gabled entryway. The brick foundation extends only the first 25 feet on the left side facade and is not used as a foundation on the right side facade. Section 2BD of the design guidelines state that the materials, texture, details, and material color of a new building's public facades shall be visibly compatible by not contrasting greatly with surrounding historic buildings. In the past, the commission has determined that new brick that appears old or reclaimed creates a false sense of history, which doesn't meet the design guidelines. Um, as such, bricks with finishes such as hand-pressed, tumbled, and rolled are inappropriate. 
In addition, brick that achieves its color by, um, by an applied surface of colored sand or with a mortar wash has also been determined to be inappropriate as it does not meet the texture of historic, uh, the color of historic brick found in the area. Staff finds that the brick as installed does not meet the design guidelines with respect to its color and texture. The color of the brick appears to be lightened by a mortar rub um, and is lighter than historic examples on this block of Clayton Avenue. The photo that you see here to the left shows the infill next to the contributing brick house next door at 1516 Clayton Avenue. Also, the bricks themselves exhibit a rougher distressed texture that's not typical of historic brick. While there are several examples uh, on this block of painted brick, staff wouldn't recommend painting the brick as a solution in this case, since the texture of the brick also does not meet the design guidelines. In conclusion, staff recommends disapproval of the brick as installed, finding it does not meet section 2BD of the Belmont Hillsboro Neighborhood Conservation District Handbook and Design Guidelines and recommends that the brick be replaced with brick that meets the design guidelines. Thank you, Ms. Sajit. Do we have any incoming calls? Or do we have any applicants? Yeah. Right, right, sorry. Oh, okay, is the applicant on the line? Hi, my name is Amanda. Um, I'm the owner of the property at 1514 Clayton Avenue, and I'm on the line. Okay, thank you. Hi. So, yes, please go on. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I wanted to point out um, the first photo shows the house at 1518 Clayton, which is stucco. Um, and uh, that was approved by the commission in 2011 when the home was built. Um, and I would say that stucco isn't a historic material. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, 1516 Clayton, which is the house immediately next to 1514, shows a very textured brick. Um, in fact, it's heavily textured, lots of different um, angles in the brick, and it actually um, looks similar to the brick that is at the house at 1514. If you go to the next picture at 1508 Clayton, um, you will see actually mixed materials on the home. Um, an example where um, there's another type of material used in the neighborhood in, uh, in addition to painted brick, stucco, and textured brick, there's also this um, rock facade that's on the house uh, that is a foss stone that I think um, is different than many of the other facades on the street. Uh, if you go to the next photo at 1503 Clayton, you actually see the stucco over the brick and the original brick in the home on that on that fireplace is in the bottom left hand corner. Um, and that brick is a very textured brick that actually is light and in color and seems to have a mortar rub applied to it and was subsequently um, painted um, or stuccoed, um, which gives another uh, interesting and neat characteristic to the street with varying materials and textures. Um, if you go to the next slide at 1501 Clayton, another example of a very highly textured brick with different variations and colors within the brick. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, there's another, this is another example. Uh, this is on the corner of Belmont and Kirkwood. So it's not directly on Clayton, but it's another example of a highly textured brick that looks different than the other bricks that I've already presented. So it seems there's quite a bit of variation in the historic brick examples. Um, and then finally, if you go to the next slide on seven, um, these are some painted brick. And the top left is actually a brick that um, has some sort of treatment to it that looks very similar to the brick that's applied. Top right is a, a mortar rub. The middle left is a painted brick. The middle right is a light colored brick with no application of uh, any materials at all. And then I even provided a couple of samples of what would happen if we whitewashed or painted the brick. And it appears to, once whitewashed or painted, look incredibly similar to some of the painted bricks um, on the street um, or within the neighborhood. 
Um, the guidelines state that the materials, texture, details, and material color of a new building's public facade shall be visually compatible by not contrasting greatly. And I don't believe that the brick that's been applied at 1514 Clayton contrasts greatly with the surrounding bricks as I've presented multiple examples of stucco brick, painted brick, stucco over a brick that looks like the brick that we used. Um, and then you'll just see there's a the comment that the um, brick creates a false sense of history. And I feel like the whole work done by the commission is to ensure that people who build no, new homes in the area create homes that match the window heights twice as tall as they are wide. The overhang is a certain distance from the home, the height of the home, the setbacks of the home, all these things put in place to ensure a house fits within the neighborhood. And I would argue that the brick that we put does a good job of fitting in the neighborhood and that in fact, some of the other things like aluminum siding, painted brick and stucco are not historic materials. Um, and I would just like the commission to consider that this brick does actually meet their um, their recommendations. I want to try to figure out a way, obviously I don't wanna tear the brick off my house and incredibly saddened by that recommendation. And I want to try to present to the commission brick and other materials used in the neighborhood that I find look incredibly similar, but also just looking for suggestions um, as I feel, I don't know that, um, feel sad, I guess, is what it is about the brick being torn down, but um, coming here to try to present um, a viable case and hoping to listen to you all about what can be done. And I appreciate your time. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. This is um, Chair Bell. I do have a question for you to, to begin. And um, thank you for your presentation. Um, did, you know, usually our, our applications that are submitted have um, a line item that says to bring materials for recommendation to the staff after your application has been approved. Um, so my question to you is, did that happen? Did the, say one more time, sorry. Did either your contractor or you bring before the staff um, your um, choice of brick to, to have, because it, it usually our application uh, approvals have that, that condition. Yes, ma'am, I understand. Um, my contractor did not bring a sample. Okay. You know, and and you might be, you know, on 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 that um, negative side of that, but I think where I, I maybe ahead a little bit of our discussion, but I think it's really important for our public and our applications to be clear that when there is a condition on the application that the contractor or builder will actually uh, collaborate and and have discussions discussions with the, uh, our staff. So um, I think it's just, uh, I say that because it's really important to hear that publicly so that um, we don't come on these uh, type of uh, show cause violations because it's really, it's really hard on our commission to, to, you know, make this kind of hard recommendation and be a, a um, um, you know, conflict for you. So just want to put that out there. Yes, ma'am. I, I understand um, completely. I've never built a home in the historic neighborhood and um, relied heavily on our contractor who's built several homes in the area. Um, and he acknowledges that a mistake on this was made. And I don't really have an excuse. I'm a grown woman, a mistake was made. And I, I realize that I don't know how to um, talk around that aside from just presenting the information that 
I've gathered um, and presenting to you now. So thank you for that, and I'm I'm sorry. Well, thank you for your presentation. Okay, uh, we're gonna just continue for discussion. Um, again, let me come back. Do we have any public comment? And there are no call-ins. So I will close public hearing and uh, commissioners, we will go into uh, discussion. Commissioners, do you have any uh, questions to our staff or even the applicant? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Uh, I do appreciate uh, applicant uh, admitting uh, omittance of a review of the brick material. So I think uh, the question to the staff, this is uh, my first case uh, uh, in this specific, you know, brick uh, outside of the uh, acceptable material. So was there uh, any case in the past or what is the, you know, what were, if we come up to violation, uh, so typically uh, the risk course is just remove the brick and then reapply appropriate material of the brick. Uh, that's uh, the recommendation I'm uh, reading. So is there any other recourse or what is the um, past case similar to this case? Or was there any uh, past case similar to this kind of uh, violation? Hi, this is, uh, this is Melissa Sajid again. Um, you know, I've been with the commission for five years. I can't think of an example um, of a material violation with brick. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think in this case, it's it's a question of, you know, is this brick, the, the color and texture appropriate and meet the design guidelines? Um, I, um, I know we've had violations with, with siding and, and more often than not, that, that leads to replacing the siding, but I can't think of an example uh, with brick. Thank you. Oh, Commissioner Fitz. Oh, I was just, I was gonna add to what Melissa said. I can think of a couple of cases since I've been on the commission that have happened within the past year and a half where the siding um, has not been compliant and required removal. Um, I don't think, well, um, this brick would not have been approved if it had been submitted. Um, and I appreciate where the applicant, you know, I appreciate the, the spot that the applicant is in, but what makes this really hard on all of us is, you know, we hate to ask someone to have to tear, you know, tear apart their finished product to make it compliant. But if we don't, um, then we're just stuck in a cycle of being asked for forgiveness all the time. Um, and it just puts us in a hard position if we don't if we don't stick by what is um, um, by what is required. So that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Price. Yes, to uh, just to add to what uh, previous two commissioners have said, I, I, I also recall um, one case in particular where we have denied brick uh, like this and painted brick in general. So um, I am uh, once again inclined to uh, support the staff recommendation for disapproval as, as difficult as that is for all of us to say. We are bound by the guidelines. Our charge here is to uphold them and it's consistent with our practice uh, since I've been on, on the commission. Yes, sir, thank you. And again, I, I sort of echo the other commissioners too. This is Commissioner uh, um, Chair Bell, that you know, it, it, it behooves um, us to say this and continue to say it so that contractors and builders are much more aware that you know it, it, the burden goes to the homeowner or the property owner and um that's not always the the right channel 
and you know we absolutely encourage and even the applicants to be aware that when they do bring an application that their contractor or builder is following guidelines um, because it does make it difficult not only on uh, the, the homeowner but you know on the commission to to um, express those guidelines appropriately. Commissioners, do you have any other questions, discussion, or a motion? Commissioner Mayhall. Well, I, I just want to commend the um, the homeowner. I, she's in a tough place. She's given a lot of good examples of, of properties uh, close to her, of brick that that looks similar to this brick. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I, she's, she's just in a tough place. And I know that this was not intentional on her part. And I understand that contractors, I mean, they're going to have to, if we vote to disapprove this, you know, they're going to have to be the ones responsible for taking this down and putting the right materials back up, hopefully, and not the homeowner. But I just wanted to express my, um, my, uh, that I feel really sorry for this homeowner and, and you know, she just got caught in a, a position. Not everybody, you know, takes applications to the zoning commission every every day, probably maybe once in their lifetime and it's it'd be an easy thing to miss. And so I just wanted to express that sentiment. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Absolutely. Any other comments or discussions? A motion, please. As hard as it may be. Commissioner Price. Yes, with respect to 1514 Clayton Avenue, I move that we accept the staff recommendation of disapproval. There is a motion. Is there a second? Commissioner Williams. I second. Okay, there is a motion and a second. I will take roll call. And please say yes or no. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall. Yes. Commissioner Price. Yes. Commissioner Williams. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That was unanimous. And again, um, Thank you to the applicant. And again, we um, hope that um, you can work that out with your, with your contractor. And we will move on to the next project, which is at 413 North 16th Street. Again, the number to call is on screen and also 629-255-1911. And Mr. Hoffman will do our presentation. Good afternoon. 413 North 16th Street is an application for a rear addition to these this contributing residence and side dormers added to the existing roof. The addition is proposed to continue the existing ridge one foot taller and removing a portion of the historic roof form at its ridge. An addition to a single story structure may be taller than the existing building at a distance of 40 feet from the front edge of the building. In this case, the additional height begins 41 feet back uh, and could be appropriate. However, staff finds the method of the connection to the addition to be inappropriate as it changes the form of the roof and is not sufficiently differentiated from the roof of the historic building. The right side uh, of the addition meets the design guidelines. However, the left side removes the existing ridge line. Staff recommends that the addition's roof is revised for the addition to meet the ridge of the house at least six inches below the existing ridge. The project includes adding side dormers to the historic house toward the rear of each side facade and side dormers on the addition. As there are no existing dormers on the house, staff reviewed neighboring historic dormers on similar roof forms, which are primarily hipped and approximately six feet in width. The proposed new dormers on the historic roof are compatible with the historic examples that staff found. The addition also includes longer dormers, 14 feet in length. Dormers on new construction may be larger than what is required on the historic building depending on their scale and location. The dormer on the left side does not meet the design guidelines uh, as it overlaps the original roof form. Staff recommends that that dormer be redesigned so that it sits only on the roof of the addition. 
In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the application with the conditions listed in the staff recommendation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hoffman. I believe the applicant is on the line. Please announce yourself and your name. Thank you. Uh, I am John Root with Root Architecture, the applicant for the project, and our office is located at 753 Alloway Street. Uh, we have diligently worked with the staff over the last few weeks, and the drawings that you see now are the result of some diligent back and forth, but ultimately we have not been able to find consensus on the roof form of this rear addition. Um, we do not agree with the recommendation to lower the rear ridge line below the existing ridge. We feel that this recommendation will be detrimental to the overall look of the home and it will present our homeowners with long-term roof maintenance problems that this recommendation would provide. Um, ultimately, we're formally requesting that we commonly refer to as a ridge raise uh, for this rear addition, not only to help accommodate the head height for a second floor addition inside the home, inside the attic, but to present a kind of a logical and more cleaner look for the final roof form. There's a couple of reasons why we propose our design to this board as the best option for this rear addition. Um, First, if we can look at the existing uh, site for a moment, um, I'm not sure if you can, there you go. Um, you will see the existing home and property are relatively small and do not provide a lot of opportunity for expanding the footprint to the rear. Uh, it's got a really small backyard. Uh, because this property has no access to a service alley, we're somewhat limited and vehicular movement is accommodated down an existing driveway to the south side of the property, uh, kind of where that little red icon is. Um, so because of the limitations on the site, we're proposing a modest 20 foot rear addition um, and only 13 and a half on the left. So it's 20 foot on the rear, rear right and 13 and a half on the rear left. So we're maintaining a distance between the two structures of the house and the garage of approximately about 27 feet. Um, that was important to our homeowner to keep some sort of backyard. Uh, when considering the new roof form here on the rear of the existing house, you'll notice that the existing house is asymmetrical in nature. I believe there's a picture of the rear of the house in one of the slides, maybe the next slide. Yes, perfect, on the right side there. Um, it extends further on the north side than it does on the south side. And because of this, it's very difficult to add on to the existing hip roof of this uh, and maintain the existing historic asymmetrical form. Um, we're kind of, our design is symmetric in nature you know, because we're trying to line it up with the center of the house and the center of the ridge form and, and uh, maintain all that. Um, staff had said that our design requires the removal of the portion of the historic roof form, but it's our opinion that only the rear facing portions of the existing roof form will be removed and therefore we comply with the guidelines. Uh, within this concept, we are presenting the addition of a small dormers on either side that are located smack in the middle of the house. Kind of on that left picture, you'll see it's going to uh, sub, uh, obscure a lot of the rear addition from your, your sight lines from the sidewalk. So visually it's minimal and ultimately it's the result of keeping the existing historic roof slope on the rear and following the one foot inset on the plan on either side. Uh, this proposal we feel provides a visual break of the roof form on the more prominent southern side between the old and the new due to the spacing between the neighboring homes due to the driveway location. Um, and I think in the guideline, you know, there's some language in there that's, that's kind of, it contradicts itself when it's talking about roof form. I believe there's some language in there about um, creating, basically creating weird roof forms and, and, and uh, awkward kind of designs. And I've presented Paul a uh, alternate roof plan. Paul, do you, do you have the ability to bring that up on um, basically what the roof would look like if we follow the staff recommendations versus what we're proposing? Do you, do you have the ability to bring that up? We don't have the ability. Okay. Well, to, and I guess let me start to verbally describe what, so the staff recommendation would be maintaining, if you look at where that red arrow is, that ridge that goes to the t to the right and the ridge line that goes to the rear of the pro property, it would create kind of a flat roof area that follows that ridge. To, and we think that it's unnecessary because when you when you see the obstacles around the site and you see that the, they're so close to the neighboring property and there's trees in the way that visually you're you're never going to really see that. Um, and we don't we feel like the the, the placement of this rear addition is appropriate and does meet the, the intent of the conservation guidelines. You know, if we were in preservation guidelines, I feel like it'd be a little more stringent, 
but I feel like the, the proposal we presented to this commission today, I think complies with the conservation guidelines uh, with regards to rear additions. So I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you guys have. And we respectfully request the approval of the project with, with only staff recommendations number three and four, I believe, and not the, um, let's see. We, we don't have a problem re redesigning the left dormer to put it on the new roof. That's not a problem. Um, the horizontal window is no problem. And um, so it's just, we're just talking about the number one um, where the ridge line needs to be maintained off the rear uh, hip roof. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Root. Ms. Gore, do we have any public comments? We do not, no phone calls. And no phone calls, okay. So we uh, will close public hearing and commissioners, we will go into discussion. Um, architects, do you have a... Uh, any thoughts about this? It's the ridge line. All right. Okay, I might start. Okay, Commissioner Fitz. Oops, I'll go ahead. Um, I know that this is this is a very difficult roof form type that pyramidal shape to add on to. Um, you know, I, I do know in the past we have allowed um, raises, especially to the when it's set that far back from the house and it's not located on a corner, which is the instance here. I think when you actually take sight lines, I was trying to look at the, I was pulling up my documents from the staff recommendations, but when you look at the documents and you actually start to look at um, sight lines of what, what you're able to see, sometimes you don't even, from the street, you're not even able to see back past, um, sorry, I'm pulling up this. Given the sight line, sometimes you can't even see that that portion of the roof that goes up. You see it in dead elevation, but from a sight line perspective, um, sometimes a, a raise that that's, that's that slight is, is difficult to actually see from the street. I did have a problem. Uh, my biggest problem with this uh, application was the dormer that was straddling the new roof form and the old roof form, but it sounds like the applicant is okay with um, making that adjustment and also the adjustment with the window. Um, but given, I guess, given the visibility and the, the it's not an extreme um, increase from the ridge line, I don't have a problem with the, um, with that addition being slightly higher, but I would like to hear from others. Okay. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it would be helpful for me to understand, uh, you know, as far as a design guideline goes uh, in relate to roof, it says the height of the addition's roof eaves must be less than or equal to the existing structures. Visually evident roof slopes should match the roof slopes of the existing structure and roof planes should set in accordingly for rear addition. So it seems like, you know, this, if I'm reading that guideline, uh, the guideline design appear to be, uh, you know, the proposed design appear to be kind of match up. So is the new roof is how much higher than existing uh, roof? One foot. Uh, one foot, okay. So, 
I'm trying to imagine. So if try to match up existing roof, so it have to be one foot lower. So as far as you know, uh, architectural point, would that be possible to design uh, those roof just over one, uh, one foot to match up existing roof? So I just cannot picture how would it work, you know, on the uh, drawing. We might have more discussion on that, Commissioner Johnson. Um, let, let's hear from Commissioner Stewart. Oh, you've got. I'll, I'll jump Robin. in for just a okay. second. And Mr. Hoffman's much more familiar with this project, so he can jump in if this is incorrect. I think the, the concern from staff wasn't so much the height as wiping out the original ridges. And so then, in a sense, changing that original reform. Mr. Hoffman, did you have anything to add? Right. This is Paul Hoffman. I, I'd say that's correct that the. What we wrote in our recommendation that the height could be appropriate, but it's the, the method of the attachment. Uh, as Commissioner Fitz stated a few minutes ago, th this is a difficult roof form to add on to. Generally speaking, uh, when we have seen a rear addition onto a hipped roof, um, the uh, that sort of V of the rear roof plane has has been required to be maintained. Uh, and in addition has gone in set of that to the rear. Um, again, this is a, a difficult one, and um, this is the applicant's um, kind of idea, uh, solution to some construction difficulties with it, but it, it was staff's review that, um, that altering that roof form and kind of consuming the existing roof form was not appropriate. Uh, Paul, can you elaborate on that some more? I'm, I'm not quite, I'm looking at the drawings, but I can't quite visualize what you're talking about here. Sure. Um, Melissa, could we go back to the overhead? I think it's easier to see from there. And if I had a, a direct overhead shot in there, uh, it would be better, but this is going to have to do. Um, again, we don't see... Uh, additions like this on on this roof form as frequently as we do with other roof forms, um, and that may be because of the the difficulty of of doing that and keeping it off that existing ridge. Um, but when you look to the the rear of the house, to the lower right of my arrow there, um, kind of wiping out those ridges, the uh, hip ridges, I guess, to the rear. Um, generally speaking, the commission has required that those be maintained and not kind of blended in with a new roof form. Does that answer your question, Commissioner? It does, yes, thanks. Okay, Commissioner Price? Yes, Paul, uh, it's been my understanding in the past that a adding on to a hip roof form like this in order to maintain the original hip ridges that the commission, the guidelines require a six inch inset. And that's all we're talking about here that would, would make the difference for this project is a six inches inset, is that correct? It generally, that's the requirement, yes, commissioner. Okay, have you spoken with the applicant about that option and um, Maybe, I don't know if it's a question for you. Yes, and um, we've gone back and forth on this uh, a little bit with Mr. Root. He did present us with a, uh, a roof form alternative uh, earlier this month um, that staff thought was, um, was headed in the right direction, but I know Mr. Root still had some, some difficulties with the uh, the con construction aspects of it and wanted to present this one, um, um, so yes, we have talked with them about how to do that, and I think given the roof form, it's it's tough. I'll say that. Commission, okay. uh, co commissioners, uh, John Root has would like to express some other thoughts. Are you agreeable? Since we've closed public hearing. Sure. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, go on, Mr. Root. Oh, thank you very much. I, I just saw something that I felt like it might be uh, clarify something. If you go to the, the side elevation in the next slide, 
I think that's what's confusing everybody here. In that bottom right, we drew the drawing to show the hatched area of the roof as the new portion and the non-hatched area, the white area, is the existing roof. And that line between those two is, is where the old hip was that's on the rear of the house that basically those two roofs would blend together and that, that roof form will now be one. So the drawing is a little deceiving, but we were trying to indicate where the new and the old kind of meet each other. And that might be helpful in kind of the discussion of why, where we want to eliminate the existing ridges. And they're all past the midpoint of the house on the rear of the house. Does that help? Uh, yeah, this is Commissioner Price. Yes, I, I understand that's the situation, um, but I also just, I know that the guidelines specify that new roof forms, new roofs on this type of roof need to need to be inset. So um, anyway, that, I'd like to hear what other commissioners may have to think about. Right, okay. Vice Chair, you have other comments? No, but I'd like to hear again from the applicant, John Root, in terms of, you know, the, the importance, and I did hear you say that it would possibly cause some water issues for that type of um, connection. Could could you just elaborate a little bit more on that? No problem. Yeah, sure. Um, so if if we're looking at the right, the left side of the house, that bottom right on their screen, um, if you maintain those ridges, that I'm going to when I set the roof, the new roof back. Um, it creates an inherent valley in the roof or a flat roof area um, that kind of, you know, long term, it's not ideal for a homeowner to kind of maintain that. Um, so I really wish we had the, the alternative drawing to show you. It creates like a little gap where that six inches that we have to recess the new roof back. Um, we can do it really nicely on the right side of the house because of the, the existing house form. Um, the, the the historic house is kind of an L-shaped form. And so it, it, when we set the new addition back one foot on the right side, uh, where you follow that existing roof form up, we just, because this pyramidal shape of the roof and that the, the left side of the historic home travels back further than the right side, where you, you know, that commonly that's not what you, what in our experience, that's not, the historic homes usually are squared off in the back, and so it's a little easier to add on to. But in this situation, it had a left wing that comes out. Does that make any sense? And maybe the uh, satellite picture on the previous slide would, would show that, that there's a, where the brick, or I think it's painted brick, kind of goes a little further back on the left side, the north side than the, than the south side where you see the white there. That's, a, that's an old porch that was filled in that will be removed in, in, this, in this concept. So inherently we have a break between those two exterior back corners of the house. I think we have that in our pack. Is that correct? Oh, yes, correct. so commissioners, we do have that in our packet. Okay. Any other discussions? Uh, Madam, Madam Chairman, um, this is Commissioner Stewart. I, um, I, I agree with both staff and the applicant that this is a difficult roof form to do an addition on. I think that uh, the owner and the applicant have proposed a modest addition to this structure that uh, that keeps in character uh, much of the existing uh, construction form shape uh, and uh, and ex extends the existing roof line. Uh, you know, given the modest nature of this and uh, that the existing roof form is being extended and that the applicant is agreeable to all the conditions except for the height, uh, I tend to see this as an acceptable 
uh, variance to uh, to to the uh, staff recommendation. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair. Anyone else? That or a motion? Oh, Commissioner Price. Yeah, uh, I don't disagree with with Commissioner Stewart. I do think, in my experience, there are there are solutions to this that will maintain the existing hip roof ridges uh, by the use of, of metal flashing rather than just um, uh, just asphalt shingles um, and feel like we as a commission should probably encourage the applicant to continue working with Paul and continue to work within the guidelines to find a solution. I feel like we're talking about six inch difference here and there should be a way to to get the addition built largely as is, that still falls with under the, with the the letter of the guideline. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there a motion? We'll just see how uh, we vote in. Mr. Price or Vice Chair. Commissioner Price, it sounds like you were close to a motion at that point. Do you want to translate your? Uh, sure, I saw, I saw your hand up. I thought maybe you were going to. Um, uh, sure, with respect to 413 North 16th Street, I move for uh, approval of the staff recommendation with conditions. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? All right, Commissioner Johnson. I second the motion. All right. I will take the roll. Please say yes or no. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz? No. Okay. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Oh, yeah, Commissioner Jones, sorry. Uh, I just got my yes, headphones to work. Yes. Sorry, um, I, yeah, I was listening. I couldn't talk. Um, no but I'm also going to yes be with. No? I'm going to say I'm voting no. Okay, Commissioner Mayhall. Yes. Okay, Commissioner Price. Yes. And Commissioner, did I already say Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Did I say Commissioner Johnson? Sorry. Ma'am, I'm voting yes. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry if I missed you. Commissioner Williams. Yes. Okay. Do we have the correct votes? All right, we have one, two, three, four, five yeses. I have two no's. Okay. So the motion passes. Thank you. We'll move on to 1124 Sharp Avenue, and the public can call in to the number on the screen or 629-255-1911, and Ms. Sajit will be our presenter. Yes, this is an application to demolish an existing non-contributing house and to construct a duplex infill at 1124 Sharp Avenue. The house located at Sharp Avenue was constructed around 1996 and does not contribute to the historic character of the Eastwood Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Staff finds demolition of the house to meet the design guidelines. Most of this block of Sharp Avenue was included in the 2014 expansion of the Eastwood Overlay. So the 1100 block of Sharp Avenue has a strong historic context of one story and modest one and a half story historic homes. The photo on top shows contributing houses located to the left of the subject property, while the bottom photo shows houses to the right. The context, the context to the right includes a mix of contributing and non-contributing houses, including the taller duplex that was constructed prior to the expansion of the Eastwood overlay. The photos here show contributing houses across the street from the subject property. So while the overall height of 25 feet could be appropriate for the historic context on this block of Sharp Avenue, staff finds that the overall scale and width of the proposed infill overwhelm the historic context. 
As proposed, the width of the infill is 38 feet 10 inches for the full depth of the house. This is much wider than historic homes on similar lots, which range from approximately 25 to 33 feet wide. Also, while the front eaves are an appropriate height for a one or one and a half story house, the width of the front dormer combined with the two story form that starts near the midpoint of the house create more of a two story form that's inappropriate for the historic context. Modestly scaled front dormers are characteristic of historic one and a half story homes on this block. The proposed infill, however, incorporates a front dormer that's approximately 30 feet wide. While the commission has approved infill with a wider front dormer in other locations, staff finds it to be inappropriate for this block of Sharp Avenue. As proposed, the width of the dormer is as wide or wider than some historic houses on similarly sized lots. Staff finds that the wide front dormer combined with the proposed building width and full two-story scale beginning at the midpoint create an overall scale that overwhelms the historic context on this block. So here are the other side facade and the rear facade. The infill does not meet the design guidelines for roof shape. As proposed, the side gables are incomplete on both side facades and give way to a hipped roof form uh, with a lower 312 pitch. Staff finds that the roof form is not typical of the historic context. The incomplete side gables that tie into the lower pitched hipped roof form along with the lower pitched gable dormer, uh, front gable dormer, um, are elements that create the two-story massing that's inappropriate um, at this location. The front setback is similar to the historic house at 1126 Sharp Avenue, which is appropriate. Um, while the project meets all base zoning setbacks, staff finds that the infill does not meet section 2B1C of the design guidelines. The infill as proposed is too wide for the historic context, which creates smaller side setbacks than is typical of historic homes on similar lots. In conclusion, staff recommends disapproval of the proposed infill, finding that the project does not meet section 2B1A for height, 2B1B for scale, 2B1C for setback and rhythm of spacing, and 2B1E for roof shape of the Eastwood Neighborhood Conservation District Handbook and Design Guidelines. Thank you, Ms. Sargent. I believe the applicant is on the line and please announce yourself and your name. Yes, uh, my name is Walid Sidder. Um, we, before we before we bought this lot, we, we looked at the area, and as you can see, there is a couple houses in, in this area here on the right-hand side. That's, it's a two-story building, and, and it's about uh, five um, houses away from us. If you go to the next, um, you see there's another also, there's about three houses. This is a also two two houses next to each other it's a duplex uh, hbr and it's a two-story height and it, it, it's it's bigger it's almost the same size as ours and it's already been approved and if you go to the next site and, and look at this is also this is at the beginning of the sharp avenue they are all all, all working with the with the with a different look for, for the sharp avenue and I, I want us to see if we could allow us to to build this house that's it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Seder. Sure, that you're correct? welcome. Correct. Okay. All right. Ms. Ziegler, have we received any public comment? Yes, we have. Um, Councilman Withers writes the following. He said, I wanted to write in support of the staff recommendation for disapproval of the proposal for 1124 AB Sharp Avenue in the Eastwood Conservation Overlay District. The staff report accurately reflects the historic cottage context to the 1100 block of Sharp Avenue. The, this proposal could potentially be okay in another portion of Eastwood that features larger houses and larger yards or that lacks as much extant contributing structures. But I agree that this proposed building would overpower the surrounding homes and context on Sharp. Certainly HPR duplexes are permitted uses in the base zoning. However, the massing on this proposal is simply too much for the context. I encourage the commissioners to support the staff recommendation. And that's the end of um, his comments and there are no phone calls. No phone call. Mr. Seder, would you like to uh, comment on the council members' comments? No, no comment. I mean, if, if, if we have to work with the staff, we'll, we'll work with the staff as much as we can and we'll come back again if, if we get this stuck. Okay, very good. 
we thank you for that. Yes, we'll work okay. with the staff to, to, to make it to make it a lot better. Maybe get a smaller I work. We work with the with the with the staff to make it to make it uh, look better. No problem. Okay, very good. Very good. Um, thank you for that offer. And uh, since we do not have any public comments, we will close public hearing. And commissioners to ask questions or discuss. Commissioner, I'm not sure who raised her hand first. Commissioner Jones? So apologize if I don't have asked you first. Oh, sure, I'll take it just real quick. Commissioner Jones here. Um, I would just like to say, um, yeah, I thank the applicant for his presentation, um, but you know, several of the structures that he mentioned either were before the overlay um, or just are in a different, you know, part. Again, we've we've moved closer and closer to, you know, to the immediate historic context, not just, you know, the entire neighborhood um, per se for the context. Um, and then it's with the historic structures, not just any structure. Um, so I am a, I'm in full agreement with uh, staff uh, recommendation on this. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Fitz? I also want to thank the applicant and um, am also in full agreement with the staff recommendation. I think one thing just for the applicant to know when you're proposing infill on a project, the context of the street and immediate surroundings is very important. And when a proposal comes in that is um, the widest, um, you know, the widest house on the street compared to the context, and then also the tallest house on the street. I think the width of the house was almost 39 feet, where the typical is 33 feet, and then having a two-story form where it's more one story or one and a half story. Um, both of those items, and then the width of the dormer kind of exceeds what we see for dormers. So I think there's a several things to work on, but I think, um, like you said, just um, I would recommend just getting back with, with staff on that and working towards a solution, but I agree with the staff recommendation. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I am pleased to hear uh, applicant is uh, willing to continue to work with staff. And I think uh, Council Member Weathers' uh, comment summarizes why, you know, this uh, current proposal is not, uh, you know, quite appropriate for that street and for that particular location. I understand, you know, surrounding area, especially HPR, and, you know, some people affectionately call tall and skinnies, because sometimes those out of the place uh, development triggers more importance of uh, keeping historical character. And for that, I'm pleased to hear uh, applicant continue to work uh, staff and hopefully uh, by working together uh, and he can come back with uh, more appropriate design and location and size and mass and so forth. And so I do, I'm inclined to support staff recommendation. Okay. <laughs> we love raising our hands, don't we? All right. Um, any further? Yes, Commissioner Jones? Sorry, my sound went out for a while, uh, for a minute there after Commissioner Johnson's comments. Um, so I was just going to say regarding uh, 124 Sharp Avenue, I. Uh, move uh, to follow staff guidelines and uh, disapprove the proposed infill. Okay, there is a motion. Is there a second? Uh, vice second. Chair. Oh, go second. ahead, Vice, vice Chair. Chair Stewart. Yeah. I second the motion. All right, there's a uh, motion and a second. And Commissioner Mayhall, do you have a comment? Uh, no, I do not. Okay. Just want to make sure we covered everybody, okay? Um, yeah. 
As I said, there is a motion and a second, and I will take roll call. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall. Yes. Commissioner Price. Yes. And Commissioner Williams. Yes. Thank you very much. We are on to the next one, which is 330 Chesterfield, and the number is on the screen, and also 629-255-1911, and Ms. Warren will be our presenter. Yes. This is an application to extend the existing partial width front porch roof such that it extends across the entire front elevation. There is an existing porch floor across the entire elevation, but the portion to the right of the door is uncovered. This is not an uncommon feature for houses of this era. This 1932 Sanborn map shows the same porch configuration, as does this photograph. Based on this evidence, staff has concluded that this is the original configuration for this particular house. Porches and primary entrances are typically considered character-defining features, which the Secretary of Interior standards requires to be retained and preserved. Here's a sketch of the proposed porch roof extension. In this instance, the partial, partial width porch is a character-defining feature of this house. Creating a full-width porch roof that will alter the front facade is contrary to the Secretary's standards. As such, staff finds the proposal to be inappropriate. Staff recommends disapproval of the porch extension, finding the project does not meet Section 2B2 of the Hillsborough West End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning overlay guidelines. Um, I know that the owner is here and would like to speak. Okay, thank you, Ms. Warren. And applicant, uh, please announce yourself and your name. Uh, hello? Mm -hmm. Yes, please, please announce yourself and your name, please. Good afternoon. Um, this is, my name is Meredith Sachs and I am the homeowner, homeowner and I have with me um, my three children here, um, ages 18, 17, and 13. I'd like to thank the commission for your time and I appreciate this opportunity. Welcome. Thank you. Um, our goal um, is that the board will see that the small change will preserve the historic integrity of the Hillsborough West End Neighborhood Association. Most four squares have a full porch and we were confused honestly when we bought the house and thought that the other portion of the porch had been taken off or like something had happened to it over the course of the years. When we made the decision to try to move forward with the porch, because what happens when it rains um, and because there are multiple leaves in that area, it becomes very slippery and dangerous and mold will grow on, on the, on the uh, slab and it becomes unusable. Um, when I learned that we would have to go to appeal, I got curious and I thought what, and I wanted to learn more about what what the board was and what it was all about. I learned that the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 created these boards. And so I looked at the guidelines and I looked at section two and it said, use measures including financial and technical assistance to foster conditions under which our modern society and our prehistoric and historic resources can exist in productive harmony and fulfill the social, economic, and other requirements of present and future generations. After I read this, I felt I had a valid, reasonable request. Under economic, to deny me the right to increase my property value with combined with the 34% tax increase feels unreasonable. Regarding productive harmony, my family of five would greatly appreciate more outdoor space to safeguard our mental health. And I believe that there is multiple evidence out there that outdoor space helps folks um, with their mental health. Due to the pandemic, we have, I have three children in online school and I also work from home. The additional small improvement would allow our family of five to just simply sit on our front porch. 
as a as a owner of the home that pays taxes and mortgages, I feel that this is a reasonable accommodation and would greatly appreciate it. I'd also draw attention to the letters I have from my neighbors who feel that it is a they have no concerns with it. Um, and additionally, Jenny suggested that one of the reasons for the denial was the building materials. Um, we are very flexible. We we only suggested using the columns or historic to the like to match the historical style. And I'm very interested in hearing from the commission about what would be acceptable. And and I hope and I mean this with the most respect for for the commission. But frankly, I'm confused because when I look around my neighborhood. I see so many examples of things that just haven't that that, that are not that, that are not historic. Um, what you're looking at right now are obviously just examples of other four squares. But like for example, multiple homes were taken down, historic homes for the building of 440. That that's our modern society. Houses in my neighborhood often have huge additions that that where it is very visible from the front of the house of the addition. I would also hope that you could look at the pictures that I submitted for 2612 Essex, Essex plates. If they could please move on in the slides. Um, right, so the house on the left, a house was torn down and this one was built. Um, and you can see that there is a huge, it's a deep interior porch, which is not historic and does not fall into any of the building um, guidelines. And then I look at this, the house on the right on Natchez Trace, where they completely tore off the entire top of the house. Also, when you look at houses like Sunset Place, also in the historic overlay, so many houses have been torn down that it looks like a brand new neighborhood. Additionally, things like solar panels, a modern society can be approved administratively. The, my bottom line here is that our modern society is that this is a pandemic and my, my I would really appreciate a little extra space for my family to to live because we're at home all the time. My neighbors are not bothered or care and it won't set a bad precedent because anyone with an existing porch should, it's a reasonable request and they should be allowed. I, I feel that families are fragile right now and we need to safeguard our mental health by allowing outdoor space. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate your time. And I really want to say that I'm flexible on my building materials. I'm looking for a compromise. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Sack. Appreciate your presentation. Ms. Ziegler, do we have any public comments? Yes, you received an email from Daniel and Drew Ann Borsos, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. They write, we are homeowners at 1109A Boscobel Street. We support the proposed adjustment of the setback for the proposed construction at 1112 Boscobel. I apologize, that was within the same email where I sent other public comment. We have not received a public comment for this particular project. Okay. Do we have any incoming calls? Okay, we have no public comment or other public yeah. comment or um, yes, ma'am. Or let me let me finish my sentence and uh, and we don't have any incoming calls. Do you have any further comment? I'm her daughter. I have a quick comment, I guess. Sure. I please uh, please announce your name. Emma Sachs. So I've, I've done a lot of reading of the, the zoning guidelines, um, and I would just like to, to point out that they are called guidelines and that all of the language for um, the, the rules, as we call them, they, they say things like we recommend, um, that Porsches you know, should, should not, uh, just that these are 
these aren't kind of set in stone terminology. And I know that when Jenny was providing for um, the specific codes that this proposal um, would go against, that I, I would just like to point out that they're not really going against these codes. They would just be going against what the guidelines recommend, but not that there's anything wrong with going against these recommendations. And I think that that's really important of, of what I've noticed about about this commission and this board is that you guys have the power to to oppose these guidelines. And that's all. Well, I must say we appreciate you reading the guidelines because um, it's it, they're very educational and also for us. So we do appreciate you um, having a better understanding of, of guidelines. So any other comments from the Sachs family? Well, have, have you also, could, could the emails from my neighbors be read, please? Or do you all have those to read, that you, they've reviewed them? No. Because I, I think that's important. No. Ms. Sachs, I don't think we have copies of those. Did you forward those? Yes, ma'am, they should be in your packets. Yes, um, and, there's a, and there's a picture, too, what my neighbor sent. Okay. Sorry. This well, is Jenny unfortunately, Warren. Unfortunately, we do not have those in front of us. So, um, um, Chair, this is Jenny Warren. Okay. Those were included in your original yeah. packet. They were part of her application. Were you able to hear me? Looking. Okay. We did get, we did get one. It looks like on my packet anyway. Okay. All right. Um, also, our, our time is up on that. So um, I will close the public hearing and commissions will, commissioners will discuss or have questions. I do, I do have a question, Jenny. Um, sure. Warren. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I do have some other, uh, we have another commissioner, but, but could you just, um, Refresh us on the disapproval, your recommended disapproval. Um, sure. What's the question specifically? We, we are recommending disapproval. On, on what basis? Well, just because it does not um, conform with the secretary standards. That porch as is, is a partial width front porch and that is original to this house. And that would be considered a character defining feature that we would want to retain and preserve. So extending that porch changes its original character and form. And this is Robin, my apologies. Um, we don't typically read public comment that is a part of your report that we receive in advance. You typically receive public comment after. But just to be clean, um, I'll just read this very quickly. This is from Suzanne Gross. Uh, Meredith, thanks so much for taking to, talking to us about your desire to match the right side of your porch to the left side. As you know, we spend a considerable amount of time on our front porch and would in no way oppose you doing the work as you stated. In our opinion, it would not lessen the integrity of the four square. In fact, we've seen numerous ones with covered porches all the way across. I've included a photo of your house from our front porch. And let me double check to see if there are others. Um, different photographs were submitted. Um, multiple times as part of your staff recommendation and his emails from the applicant at a later time and some quotes on architectural styles. This one is from Suzanne Eddy. Hi, Meredith. This is fine with us. No problem. It'll be a nice extension. All the best. She lives at 328 Chesterfield. Um, Susan, thanks for talking to me today about extending my porch roof over the existing porch slab. I was emailing to confirm your support of the porch. Sorry, that was Meredith to Miss Eddy. And I believe that is all of the public comment. Sorry for all the confusion. Okay. So we're for sure now closing public comment. Yes. Public uh, hearing. Okay. All right. Um, I do see, a co I think, Commissioner Mayhall, did you have your hand raised? Uh, I did. I just wanted to point out the the uh, the comments um, that Robin just read that I saw okay. in the packet, and and sure. and I just want to say that that God, this is this is you know I don't know this is a tough one. It, I guess they're all tough, but 
seems like her request kind of balances out the house and uh, and I can see the need and uh, you know I, I'm just interested in what the other commissioners have to say Commissioner Jones uh, yes Commissioner Jones um, yeah I'd like to thank the applicant uh, and her family and while obviously um, you know these are interesting and uh, very challenging times for everyone uh, you know, just to bring it back to our, our core purpose as a commission is to uphold the Secretary of the Interior standards, um, one of which is not changing character-defining features of historic homes. Um, there, I mean, that's uh, aesthetically pleasing. If the neighbors are okay with it, those things do, I mean, to be frank, do not matter. Um, we are upholding the Secretary of Interior standards. That is our charge. And therefore, I mean, I've been on this commission long enough that we have, that, you know, there's several, there's, there are many, um, you know, what requests uh, that, yeah, sure, they might look good or, you know, but that's not what um, the question is. This is a historic home. This is an original feature of that historic home and therefore should not be altered. Um, and therefore, I um, agree fully with uh staff and uh, Jenny Warren's um, recommendation. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Fitz? Yes, I agree with everything that Commissioner Jones just said when it comes to the Secretary of Interior Standards um, and, and what we're asked to do as this commission. Um, the front uh, facade of the home, um, you know, we do not allow, um, we don't allow alterations to those character defining uh, features and, and rarely if ever allow any type of alteration to the front of the house. We've had people request to move front doors. We don't allow that. We've had small, um, you know, requests to remove dormers or, you know, different, different things that have been requested and while there are four squares that have full porches across them what makes the you know what makes those houses unique is about the historic characteristics that each one has and so it's about preserving your house as it was not making it look like another house so um yeah it, it, it just know that we really rarely ever, if ever, um, allow alterations to the front of, of houses. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I do appreciate uh, the reasoning behind the application from the applicant. Uh, totally understand uh, their reasoning but i think we have to follow uh, the guideline and uh, from the secretary of interior and also the guideline we uh, put in this particular neighborhood and it says uh, generally an addition should be situated at the rear of the building in such the way that it will not disturb either front or side facade so I think in this particular house, offset side porch is the one of the historical character. So as much as I do understand other houses in that same street has a front porch and roof line extended all the way to the house, but looking at the historical picture and uh, looking at other houses. Uh, the offset side porch is the main historical character of this house. So therefore, uh, I am uh, inclined uh, to uh, staff recommendation. Yes. Commissioner, would you like to make a motion? Or other discussion? Commissioner Jones. Sure, Commissioner Jones. Uh, I will go ahead and move uh, to follow staff recommendations for 330 Chesterfield Avenue in the disapproval of the porch extension. Commissioner Price. Second. Okay. 
There's a motion, there's a second. I will call the roll. Yes or no, Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. We are moving on to next project, which is 2806 Oakland Avenue. And again, the number for public call-in is 629-255-1911. And Ms. Baldock will be our presenter. 2806 Oakland, sorry. Trying to run the PowerPoint and talk at the same time, it's hard. Okay, 2806 Oakland Avenue is a circa 1930 brick bungalow that contributes to the historic character of the Belmont Hillsboro Conservation Overlay. While the house is a one and a half story form on the front and right facades, on the left, the addition is two stories above a raised basement. This is a historic condition according to the Sanborn Max. The applicant proposes to construct a rear addition and a detached accessory dwelling unit. This is a site plan. The addition and DADU meet all the base zoning setbacks. The addition's footprint is 1,201 square feet as compared with the historic house's footprint, which is 1,743 square feet. On the left side, the addition is inset approximately 13 feet from the back of the corner for a depth of approximately 11 feet, after which the addition steps back out. On the right side, the addition is inset two feet for its entire depth. The proposed addition largely has a one and a half story form above a raised basement. The addition will be no taller and no wider than the historic house. On the right side of the house, there is an existing shed dormer that will be reconfigured as a side facing dormer at the rear. This dormer will be inset two feet from the wall of the addition and in a total of four feet from the main wall of the historic house. Because there is an existing dormer and because the dormer is inset four feet from the side wall of the historic house, staff finds that it is scaled appropriately and meets the design guidelines. The rear portion of the left facade contains a rooftop deck. Staff finds that this deck increases the perceived height and scale of the addition and rooftop decks are not a historic roof form. Staff therefore recommends that the roof deck be removed. Here is the rear addition showing the roof, roof, the roof deck uh, that staff is recommending to be removed. This is the DADU. The DADU meets all the design guidelines and the DADU ordinance. And finally, staff is recommending approval of the project with the following conditions. Um, I won't read them all, but the main two are just that the rooftop deck be removed and the lap siding have a maximum reveal of five inches. And I believe the, um, architect will be speaking on the project. Okay, thank you, Ms. Baldock. And applicant, um, please announce yourself and your name. Yeah, uh, my name is Martin Wick. I'm at 912 Bailey Street. I'm the architect for this project. Um, when we started the design for this project, we <clears throat> pretty quickly reached out to staff to ask about that existing two-story uh, portion on the house. Um, it was determined that it was uh, that it was historic and that after the typical step in uh, of a portion of the addition, we could align our addition with the eave height on that uh, on that two story portion for at least some section of our addition. Um, we instead chose to keep the aligned portion of the addition matching the lower one story eave uh, and are only matching the two story portion at the least visible sections uh, of our design. Um, the middle section at the rear of the historic house is two stories, but it's set, it's 10, it's only 10 feet wide and is set 13 feet, six inches back, uh, from the outside wall of the historic house. Uh, and then the other area is the back corner of our addition. Um, because the outside walls of both portions are set in from the, the walls of the historic house, the guidelines actually allow both of these sections to be two stories regardless. Um, so for our addition, we decided to take some design cues from that unique rear corner of the house. Uh, it kind of feels almost like a, a sun porch or a, a sleeping porch or something like that. Um, and in our addition, decided to 
sort of, like we said, take that piece and update it to a more contemporary style. Uh, the two-story eave over the addition's rear porch uh, is set 76 feet back from the front wall of the house, uh, and it's only a 14-foot, 8-inch by 16-foot, 8-inch section, similar to the 13-foot, 6-inch by 20-foot section of two-story eave on the existing house. Uh, staff is calling it a roof deck, um, but I would call this a porch or a sleeping porch, really, because it's located at the second floor of the house, uh, not on on the roof of the house. Um, we've designed it with a modern version of the low slope roof that the historic house over has over its two story portion. Um, and I, I'll be honest, I'm not really sure why removal is our only option here. Uh, staff has given us two reasons for that change. One of which is that what they're calling the roof deck makes the addition appear too tall. But we are meeting all guidelines as written for eave heights and stories allowed in an addition. The guidelines allow an addition to be a full two stories behind a one-story house if the wall steps in and remains two feet from the exterior wall of the historic house, which this portion of the addition does. There is also nothing in the guidelines that prohibits a porch at the second floor of an addition. So simply saying we can't have a porch at the back of the house doesn't make sense either. Basement space due to the grade change is a benefit here and adds to the perceived height but the guidelines aren't designed to penalize a project for grade change like this. We are still allowed to follow all guidelines as written with regards to eave heights and massing as though there was no basement. And we are following all of those guidelines while attempting cr to create a more contemporary piece at one of the least visible portions of the lot. If there was no basement here, would this still be an issue? Uh, also in regards to the roof form, the first section of the guidelines cited, which is 2B1E, uh, which describes roof forms for new construction, not additions specifically, mentions that roof forms should not contrast greatly from the existing roof. The section se second section cited, 2B2, which is specifically for additions, simply states that visually evident roof slopes should match existing slopes. Uh, this portion does not have a visually evident roof slope, and a, and a change in roof slope to match existing conditions is not even offered as a solution to this project. Uh, if nothing else, I don't understand why staff has not had that discussion with us about adding some sort of sloped roof over this. Um, staff's only other reason is that we can't have decks at upper levels because such features did not exist historically. But covered sleeping porches are a design feature on many historic houses, and there are also examples of two-story sleeping porches. Um, aside from that, the guidelines don't prohibit using new construction methods or design ideas for houses. Uh, that reasoning shouldn't really apply to this or really to any project in a neighborhood conservation overlay. Um, large detached garages didn't exist historically, but we can design those in, into outbuildings now. Uh, gas fireplaces that don't require a chimney are newer inventions, but we can use those. Open concept kitchens and living rooms are not typical historic features. And now houses Many were built when electric lighting and indoor plumbing didn't exist, but that doesn't mean we can't use those design features uh, in new construction. So I'm not, I don't understand why this is being used as a reason to remove a porch from the back of a house. Um, guidelines specifically include a section which states, contemporary designs for additions to existing properties are not discouraged when such additions do not destroy a significant historical, architectural, or cultural material and why such design is compatible by not contrasting greatly with the size, scale, color, material, and character of the property, neighborhood, or environment. Uh, what's the point of including that if we can't use a contemporary design ideas or features that did not exist historically? We are designing a piece that directly relates to the historic house using contemporary methods and materials. Uh, so without more explanation, I don't understand why we're being told to remove this porch. Um, and I'd like to know exactly what specific guidelines we are violating by having a rear porch that require it to be completely removed and not adjusted in any way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wick. Ms. Ziegler, have we received any public comment? No, there's been no public comment and no phone calls. And no phone calls, okay. So we will close public, public hearing and commissioners to have questions to staff or the applicant.
Commissioner Price. Yes, yeah, so this is a question for the applicant. Mr. Wick, it sounds like you're open to working with staff on um, revising the roof form for the rear porch. Is is that correct? And have you, have you talked with Melissa about that? Uh, yeah, you know, that's it's one of the things that's kind of confused me about this is the only comment that I've gotten back so far is that it has to be removed completely. Um, I would be willing to work out some other roof form if that would be more appropriate for this. Um, and, I, you know, I'm willing to talk about that. I just I haven't, you know, they have it hasn't been offered as a solution. So I'm trying to I, I would like to be able to find a compromise for that. Yes. Okay. Um, Melissa, could you address that? This question of mine is, is there room to make some sort of porch on the rear of the building possible or is it so position is that rooftop decks aren't a form that you see, you know, at this upper level historically, and that it's not something we found to be appropriate here. Um, that was staff's position that, you know, rooftop deck in and of itself is just not appropriate. I guess my question is, what's the difference between a rooftop deck and a rear porch? If, it, if it's a design, is there is there a design solution to it being considered a rooftop deck? Let me just see. Let me go back to um, the design. You know, I mean, I think something that kind of came off of the, you know. Uh, Perhaps something that, you know, didn't cut into the roof. I mean, I think part of this is that it's cutting into a roof form. That's kind of, you know, it's a notch in the roof versus kind of like a rear porch that's at an upper level where you're kind of accessing it from, you know, the back gable, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's going to be cut into the roof. Yeah, okay, that, that makes sense to me. Okay. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. I do want to ask that um, applicant was, um, I know the recommendation on uh, number two was for lap siding having a maximum reveal of five inches. Applicant, do you have a comment on that? Um, yeah, we're, we're fine with that. We're actually working with uh, Melissa right now because um, the areas that we're showing bigger reveal are kind of the accent areas. Uh, and we're looking at some different materials there, but. Um, if there's anywhere that, that we use it as the primary material, we understand that it needs to be a, a five inch reveal and are willing to change that. Um, Good. I did also just want to briefly comment on that last point. Uh, you know, the, the roof over the existing two story portion essentially cuts into the existing gable, you know, similarly to what we're doing here. And so as, as I was saying before, I'm willing to look for a compromise that if it's something that more closely matches that, um, you know, that's, that's something I'm willing to talk through as well. Okay. I just would like to remove, I, would, I wouldn't want the commission or the, uh, the final recommendation to be that it has to be removed. I would hope that we could change it so that it's at least working through something and some portion could still be similar to that uh, at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, further discussion or a motion? Commissioner Price? Yes, in reference to 2806 Oakland Avenue, I move that we approve the staff recommendation with conditions and that the applicant continue to work with staff on the design solution <laughs> or, excuse me, condition one, the rooftop related to the rooftop deck. Okay, there's a motion, is there a second? <laughs> Bless you. Commissioner so Williams? A second. Okay, there's a motion and a second, and I will call the roll. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Commissioner Fitz? Okay, we might come back to you, Commissioner Johnson. Yes.
Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall. Yes. Commissioner Price. Yes. Commissioner Williams. Yes. Okay, and Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Thank you very much. And we will move on to 1900 Beachwood Avenue. Again, the public can call in at the number on the screen and 629-255-1911. And Ms. Baldock will be our presenter. 1900 Beachwood Avenue is a circa 1900 two-story colonial revival house that contributes to the historic character of the Belmont Hillsboro neighborhood conservation zoning overlay. Uh, MHCC approved the existing one-story garage in 2008. The applicant proposes to add on to the top and the interior side of the existing outbuilding. The outbuilding does require um, setback determinations. Uh, usually there's a 10 foot setback from the side street, um, but the existing one does not meet that 10 foot setback and they're kind of increasing the footprint slightly to be three foot 11 feet from that um, side property. Uh, you can see here that the property line, I think is about where the fence is or thereabouts. The, um, there is a wide public right of way, so it seems more than 10 feet, but when you look at the actual site plan, it, it's just about a little bit less than four feet. Um, we, one, I'm sorry, I have kids in the house. Um, one of the other conditions is to push back the two-story form to meet the five-foot setback off the rear, uh, and the applicant has agreed to that condition. Uh, here are the elevations. Staff finds that the elevations all meet the design guidelines. And again, here is the um, recommendation. Staff recommends approval of the project uh, with the condition of the two-story portion of the outbuilding be five feet from the rear property line. Again, the applicant has agreed to that and has already submitted drawings. And then the other two are our standard conditions. Okay. And I believe the applicant from the previous one will be speaking on this. Okay, thank you, Ms. Baldog. Applicant, announce yourself and your name. Uh, yep, this is Martin Wick again at uh, 912 Bailey Street, um, the architect for this project. Uh, as Melissa said, we have worked out the, the five foot setback um, and I believe are meeting uh, all conditions now. So we are happy with the, the recommendation. That is good to hear. <laughs> all right, uh, Ms. Ziegler, have, do we have any public comments? We have not and we have not received any phone calls. Okay, we will close public hearing. Commissioners? Commissioner Jones? Sure, um, I'd just like to thank the applicant. I think this is a great project um, and uh, yeah, great presentation by Melissa. And therefore, in regards to 1900 Beachwood Avenue, I uh, move for approval with uh, staff recommendations. Okay. Commissioner Fitz. Commissioner Fitz. Sorry, second, I second that motion. Okay, there's a motion and a second and any comment from Commissioner Mayhall? Uh, no, I just raised my hand to second the motion. Okay, very good. And I will call the roll. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. All right, thank you so much. We are moving on to project 924B Douglas Avenue. Again, the number to call in is 629-255-1911. Ms. Sajit will be our presenter. Yes. Um, the house located at 924B South Douglas Avenue was constructed in 2007 before the Waverly Belmont Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay was adopted. 
Given the recent date of construction, the house does not contribute to the historic character of the, of the neighborhood. Um, and so this is a request to build an outbuilding. Um, a little background, this lot is subject to a horizontal property regi regime or HPR and includes a detached duplex, 924A and 924B South Douglas Avenue. An outbuilding associated with Unit A was permitted by the Codes Department in 2014. This was also prior to the overlay. According to that building permit, the footprint of the existing outbuilding on the lot is 672 square feet. Since the lot is greater than 10,000 square feet, the maximum total footprint for outbuildings on the lot is 1,000 square feet. The, the proposed outbuilding um, with this project has a footprint of 700 square feet. So together the existing outbuilding, um, the total foot with the existing outbuilding, the total footprint of outbuildings for the lot would be 1,372 square feet, which exceeds the maximum of 1,000 square feet. The proposed outbuilding is two stories, which could meet the design guidelines since the house is two stories as well. Um, however, it exceeds both the maximum ridge and eave heights in the design guidelines. The maximum ridge height per the, the guidelines is 25 feet, um, while the proposed height is 27 feet 5 inches. The maximum eave height in the guidelines is 17 feet, whereas the proposed eave height for this project is 18 feet 4 inches. Um, the site plan as submitted, um, it doesn't include um, the entire lot with the other unit and the existing um, outbuilding, um, but as proposed, the outbuilding would meet all setbacks. Um, in conclusion, staff recommends disapproval of the project, finding that the proposed outbuilding does not meet sections 3BH, 3H1B for footprint and 3H1C for the ridge and eave heights of the design guidelines for the Waverly Belmont Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Thank you, Ms. Sajit. I do see that the applicant has his hand raised, he or she has his hand raised, and please announce yourself and your name. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Troy Harper. I, uh, I'm the designer of the project. Um, speaking on behalf of uh, Bram Kane, the contractor, and uh, uh, Chris and Katya, the owners. Um, we we recently submitted the project, and we are actually in agreement with uh, everything historical um, is saying. Uh, you know. What we're looking to do is actually redesign conforming to the guidelines as far as uh, total structure height and uh, eave height, et cetera. Uh, our, our biggest and truly our only concern is um, that if the existing structure at the A house didn't exist, what we would like to um, represent that that would work within the guidelines um, if the existing structure wasn't there everything would be accepted so <laughs> um, our, our limitation of 300 square foot in order to um, get a, a, a two-car garage and yes and Melissa if you don't mind going back to the uh, site plan if possible so here on the site plan um, you know, by design, we have this great alley and, you know, we've got these two houses, each of which, you know, have a, are single family homes, they're 600 plus thousand dollar houses. And so uh, as we see the garage and actually the design of ours relates really closely uh, with the single story two car garage, as far as like the double doors and all of that, uh, our, our only thing that is throwing us off is in this new house this that we we're, we're limited to a 300 square foot structure um if and again if that didn't exist we would have zero limitation we would actually uh redesign and submit and be you know well within and conform um i, I guess i guess that's that's my only request is to um I guess I'm trying to exhaust all solutions as to 
how do we further de to develop for consistency? How are we conforming to historical guidelines? How can we utilize, you know, Nashville city planning and uh, get a two car garage that it relates to the A structure for the B structure as well, so that it actually looks like development is consistent and complete. Um, I don't know if that seems unorganized, or, but that that is that is the concern from from us is we actually want to resubmit within guidelines. But our our request is that we can. Um, we want to meet the square footage that would actually relate to the A structure. And so that there would be consistency between A and B, just like there is the main structures as well. Okay. okay. We might get back to you on that. All right, do you have any other comments? Um, I, I don't believe so. Um, at this moment. All right. Do we have any public comment? No public comment and no phone calls. Okay, and no phone calls as well. So I will, there's no rebuttal on that from the applicant. So uh, we will close public hearing and discussion by commissioners or questions. Commissioner Fitz. I just, I have a question. I guess I'm confused by some of the statements the applicant made and just wanted some clarification. You are limited in the amount of square footage total between the two buildings that you're allowed to have on site. Are you saying you would tear down the existing one and build two so that you would be in compliance? Is that what you were saying? Or are you saying that you're okay building 300 square feet? Uh, or was it neat no, neither of those? I wasn't I wasn't quite clear on what you were actually saying you sorry. Uh, if you could clarify that. Yeah, yeah so you. so the um you know standard zoning it, it's every accessory structure is limited to uh seven hundred square foot per um per parcel of land. Um under under the uh historic overlay both A and B structures are now limited to a 1,000 square foot footprint. Um, now, the the structure that you're seeing that was developed there in the common area, which is that two car garage, uh, is uh, 672 square feet, which you know limits us and our ability to do something of the same scale. Um, you know, we're, we're wanting to be able to look consistent uh, within the neighborhood and do a two car garage to, you know, you to have proper use of the alley, secure vehicles, get the, uh, you know, as density happens, you know, we're able to have guests park on the street and the owners can park in the garage. So, so the request is that, um, that I believe that we're looking for is that the structure we would redesign to meet all guidelines. Uh, the request would be that instead of being limited to a 1,000 square feet, is that we would actually be able to uh, build a structure that would uh, relate uh, to the two car that ex that currently exists on the A structure as well. So that this the development of these two particular houses, everything looks complete and consistent. I have just I have just not created the revised plan yet. Uh, so I guess what I'm what I'm asking is if we could if we could get that allowance, I could then continue with um, historical and revise and resubmit in order to uh, continue with next month. I, I guess is what I'm what I'm saying. Uh, are, did, sir, are, you, are you asking are, are you asking to defer? Um, essentially, if, uh, you know, I guess we haven't spent the hours revising and resubmitting, the, the request would be that instead of being limited to the 328 square feet, um, would you guys uh, see it as beneficial to uh, consistency in the neighborhood and further development in the neighborhood uh, with the request that the structure that we're proposing the bill would would match the structure for um, 
the A as far as footprint. So we would we would be requesting that we could build a structure of the same size for consistency and alley use for a two car garage. Okay. So, so what, what is before us right now, applicant? is that um, the plans that you have um, submitted has is recommended to be disapproved. So if it Correct. is, that is what we're looking at today. So that is what our commission will vote on, discuss and vote on, is, is that clear? Correct, yes. Okay, all right, I've got another commissioner that would like to, so we, we will hold on asking you further questions until we have more discussion. Um, commissioner Johnson? Yes, Chair, thank you. Uh, a question to the staff. Uh, this uh, 1,000 square foot maxim maximum of outbuilding, is this only applicable to the historic zoning overlay or uh, just the entire um, outbuilding for uh, like our zoning? Like, uh, is it a code a requirement or specific to uh, historical overlay? Okay, so I believe that um, that this, the, the thousand square feet for lots greater than 10,000 square feet is specific to properties and historic zoning overlays. It has been in effect since at least 2014, um, be, you know, right before this, this overlay went into effect. And, and just to clarify a little before, I think um, it sounds like the applicant is willing to work with us on the, the ridge height and eave height, um, but, they're requesting for a larger footprint um, than than the thousand square feet. So it seemed like there was a little confusion beforehand. Yes, and that, uh, that, that's why that I, is, yeah, sorry, I, I that because even though applicant is uh, willing to work with our staff, still you know three hundred seventy-two square foot overage of the maximum. So. It, he may be able to reduce the size, but it would be enormously difficult to uh, limit the square footage to, you know, 372 square foot. So uh, could, so this uh, particular uh, unit, uh, because this is a uh, non-contributing historical unit, but because of after the overlay, it is existing within the overlay, and therefore now it's limited to 1,000 square foot uh, outbuilding uh, size. Uh, am I understanding correct? Yes, uh, and just um, as a side note, there, there have been many occasions when the commission has approved outbuildings in cases of duplexes, um, and, and for those, they have been limited to the maximum for for the lot. So, so while these homes, as well as the existing outbuilding, were permitted before the overlay, um, I mean, there are similar examples um, for outbuildings uh, on lots with duplexes, um, and in all in all neighborhoods that that serve. And this is Robin Ziegler. I just wanted to make two quick points. Um, the, the square footage size is proportional to the lot size, not to the number of units. And that they're actually getting more by being in the overlay than they would have if they were not in the overlay. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? or a motion. Commissioner Price. Yes, uh, with respect to 924B South Douglas Avenue, I move that we uh, accept staff recommendation of disapproval. Okay, Commissioner Fitz. A second. Okay, there is a motion and a second. I will take the roll. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Thank you very much. And we have been in session for uh, two and a half hours, and I recommend that we take a 10-minute uh, break.
Is that good with the commission? By our uh, chair? Yes. yes. Okay. We, the commission will take a 10 minute break. Thank you so much. Informed, and thank you for taking the break. It is uh, we're now going into 1901 Holly Street, and again the number to call is 629-255-1911, and Mr. Alexander will be our presenter. Okay, um, this is a proposal for new construction, a new house and outbuilding on a lot where a historic house had been. The previous house was destroyed by the March 3rd tornado. Uh, there we go, sorry, it looked like our screen was flickering there. Um, go back to the front elevation, thank you. The new house will be one and one and a half stories with a cross gabled form. It'll be 32 and a half feet tall from grade with 13 and a half foot tall eaves and a one and a half foot tall foundation. Uh, and this is compatible with one and a half story houses on the block, which range from 25 to 35 feet tall. It will be 42 feet wide with an eight foot deep partial width porch. Uh, this is compatible with historic houses, especially on other corner lots of this block. Uh, which has historic houses that are 43 and 44 feet wide. Um, sort of just in the side, uh, know that staff uh, regularly discusses appropriate heights and width with pr prospective applicants, uh, maybe giving a range or a maximum of what's an appropriate uh, width or height or depth. Um, and we advise applicants that maximizing all of those, maximizing the width and the the height simultaneously, uh, even though individually those are appropriate, uh, the result combined could be a massing that's too large. Um, and while the height and width of this proposal are both in the upper ranges for the context, the massing is broken up, broken up uh, in a way that only a small portion of the building uh, has that, that height of 32 feet. Uh, much of it is actually the majority of the house is much shorter. Also, uh, only a portion, uh, not the entirety of the building has uh, that full width, only really the, the center mass of the building has a 42 feet width, um, uh, which occurs uh, somewhat pretty far back from the front. Uh, and now you can move on to the, the front elevation. Uh, the setback matches out of the previous building. The side setbacks are appropriate uh, for the context. The materials are appropriate. Uh, staff does recommend a condition that brick, stone, roof color, and window and door selections shall be approved. Um, that's the rear elevation, the, the window rhythm and proportions on the front, rear, and right sides are appropriate. Um, one more slide to the, so this left elevation was what you saw in your staff recommendations. Uh, Melissa, if you could go, I inserted a new slide, if you could, there you go. Um, so typically the proportion of first story windows are larger than the upper story windows. Uh, and that was a condition we had based on that last slide. Uh, the applicant submitted a revision that shows an appropriate proportion of windows um, on the side, um, so we'll we'll get to that. But that's a, a condition that we had in the recommendation that, that the applicant has already addressed. Uh, next slide. The outbuilding meets all of the design guidelines. Uh, and finally, 
uh, staff recommends approval of the proposed infill and out building at 1901 Holly Street uh, with uh, the applicant, the uh, conditions listed, listed on the staff report. Uh, number three uh, is the condition that they've already addressed. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. And I see that the- uh, David Bronner is on the line. I, I saw his name on the list. Right. He would be the applicant. Right, but please announce yourself and your name, please. Actually, um, this is Aaron Armstrong. I'm the applicant and owner of the property at 1901 Holly Street. Um, we're a 10 year plus Lachlan resident. We currently live over on Forest Avenue. And I just wanted to take a minute to thank the staff for the hard work that they put into the process. We were able to defer last month and work with staff to modify and make some changes to the plan, which led to being able to get staff approval. Um, and I think that the work that we put in um, based off of their comments led to a better design and a more efficient house. And we're grateful for Sean and the rest of staff's input on the process. Um, we did make the window changes. Uh, initially, we hadn't had time to study that yet, but um, after further evaluation, we think that that's a reasonable request. And so we've made that change to the to the right or to the left elevation of the home, and we're comfortable with all the other um, requests that they've put in in terms of approval of um, of brick selection and window selection and things like that. So um, I don't have any any other comments. We feel like this is a really important lot. Um, it kind of sets the tone for what I believe to be one of the most um, devastated blocks due to the tornado. And so we're really uh, really excited about the opportunity to put together a project that we feel like will. Um, keep with the rhythm and the massing uh, of, the, of the block and the historic context. So thanks again for everybody's input. And um, I ask for you to consider approval, but I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Okay, we are also uh, very grateful that you are a survivor. Mr. Armstrong. Thank you. And family. Okay, uh, Ms. Ziegler, do we have any public comment? We do, Councilman Withers sent an email and he wrote, I wanted to write a quick note of support and appreciation for the proposed new infill for 1901 Holly Street on today's agenda. It's rare that architects provide so much detail in their drawings of what home designs would look like. Pfeffer to Road has done a great job with this design work and communicating to the neighborhood about what the overall vision for this corner would look like once this house and outbuilding is constructed. Neighbor feedback has been quite positive. Amid so much change that has occurred in East Nashville and the Lachlan Springs neighborhood this year, it's a relief to know that longtime Lachlan Springs neighbors will be moving to this location and creating a new home there that reflects such an understanding of the unique architectural features found in some of the homes in those blocks that are adjacent to the Shelby Golf Course. The future homeowners have long been active in the Lachlan Springs neighborhood, and this project design is reflective of the care that they have always shown for their neighbors, particularly during the recovery efforts from the March 3rd tornado. I encourage the commissioners to support the staff recommendations for this application. And there have been no calls. So thank you, Commissioner Withers, I mean, Council Member Withers for a very succinct uh, comment. Mr. Armstrong, do you have any other comments or uh, not really per se rebuttal to the Council Member, but just any other thoughts? I do not, I appreciate his support. Uh, I, I didn't ask him to do that, so I think it's very thoughtful for him to take the time to do that, and I appreciate his comments. Yes, very good. We always get really good support from uh, the council member. <clears throat> okay, um, no other public comments, so we will close public hearing and discussion by Vice Chair Stewart. Madam Chairman, uh, I regret the loss of the historic home in this area and uh, and all the devastation that occurred in this neighborhood, but it is so uh, refreshing and encouraging to see the proposal that, uh, that Mr. Armstrong has brought forth to us. Uh, it is a wonderful proposal, and unless other commissioners have objection, I would like to move for approval with staff recommendations of 1901 Holly Street. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair, and I will um, entertain Councilman, uh, she is, but Commissioner Johnson as well. 
Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, I will second uh, the motion, and as well as I would like to extend uh, sympathy to uh, Mr. Armstrong and sincere appreciation to the commitment to rebuild a historical home. Thank you, Commissioner. So there's a motion and a second, and I will take roll. Vice, Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Commissioner Mayhall? Uh, yes. Thank you. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Very good, thank you. And we move on to 1917 Holly Street. Again, the number to call in is 629-255-1911. And Mr. Alexander will be our presenter. Um, as Mr. Armstrong said in the last case, this block did get hit very hard. I think there were seven, at least seven, maybe eight houses uh, that were demolished, destroyed on this block. And this case uh, at 1917 Holly Street is another, uh, an application to, to construct a new one-story house, replacing a one-story house that was destroyed by the March 3rd tornado. The new house will be uh, one story, uh, as I said, with a ridge height of 20 feet from grade, an eave height of 10 feet, and a one foot tall foundation. Uh, and this is compatible with the context. Um, the house will be 33 feet wide, uh, which is also compatible with the context. Um, the front setback matches the location of the previous house and the side setbacks uh, are compatible with the street established street pattern. The roof form and materials are appropriate. Uh, staff recommends a condition that the roof color, window and door selections are approved. Uh, on the the rhythm and proportion of windows is appropriate, uh, but staff recommends that mulligans should be added between paired windows uh, on the front and uh, side elevations. Um, these are just some 3D renderings. Um, staff recommends approval of the proposed infill and uh, no outbuilding, just the proposed infill at 1917 Holly Street with the conditions listed on the staff report. Sean, do we also um, approve exterior cladding in this overlay? I didn't see that on your recommendation, but. Uh, it was in the, the the full recommendation. I didn't uh, put much, all I said in the, uh, in my presentation today was just that it was appropriate. Uh, it, it is a uh, cement fiber cladding um, for the, the primary siding, split face block for the foundation, asphalt shingle for the roof. Uh, we just need to review the color. Uh, the, the one thing that's uh, a little different than, or that you don't typically see is they're using a steel tube, a paired steel tube columns for the front porch column. Um, that is not typical. Um, but uh, but it's new construction and, and there's not a requirement that it has to match, uh, you know, a historic form. It doesn't need to be a, a fluted column or a battered column. Uh, this is sort of a, a modern interpretation uh, because it's uh, individually, it may be a little too slender, but as a pair, it, it gives the, the indication of a, a proper column proportion. It's also in the rear. Uh, this is for the front porch. The, oh, the rear porch. has, uh, those are our larger columns. I think they'll actually be split face block, uh, probably, perhaps with the cladding over them, but but that's basement level and, and we didn't have a major concern about that either. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mr. Alexander, and if the applicant is on the line, um, please announce yourself and your name. Okay. Shall we? Um, no call in from the applicant either. Right, we had we had a name down, but it doesn't look like we see 
the applicant name on screen or call in. So we will move on with that. And do we have any other public comment? No public comment and no callers. Okay, very good. We will close public hearing and discussion by commissioner. Plural. Commissioner Jones. Yes, uh, Commissioner Jones, and um, yeah, similar to uh, Commissioner Stewart and well, and everyone's um, consolation with uh, losing these historic homes on this block, especially in this part of uh, East Nashville. Um, I commend the prior homeowner and also this homeowner and architect for um, coming up with nice new homes to to really fit in and add to the add back the character of this area. Um, therefore, regarding 1917 Holly Street, I would like to uh, move for approval um, with staff recommendations. Commissioner Price. I second the motion. Okay, there is a motion and a second. I'll take the roll call or is there any other questions? I believe Commissioner Johnson may have raised her hand. Okay, otherwise we will take the roll. Okay, Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall. Yes. Commissioner Price. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Williams. Yes. Very good, thank you so much. And we are on our final project of 916 Acklin Avenue. And Ms. Baldock will be our presenter. And again, that number is 629-255-1911. Nine sixteen Acklin is currently a vacant lot. In February, 2020, the Metro Planning Commission approved the subdivision of the lot into four separate lots. In April, 2020, MHCC approved the design for four houses on these four lots. This applicant represents a new design, application represents a new design for the rightmost lot of the four lots. This is a site plan. The application is for infill and outbuilding and they meet the base zoning setbacks. The historic context includes both two-story and one to one and a half story houses. The previously approved design was for a two-story house. This infill is also two-story. The height and scale of the proposed infill is similar to that of the previously approved infill and the historic context. Here are the other elevations. Staff finds that the infill's height, scale, materials, fenestration pattern, roof form, and overall design meet the design guidelines. Here is the garage, which does not contain a dwelling unit and meets the design guidelines. So in conclusion, staff is recommending approval with the conditions that you see on the screen and that are in your staff recommendation. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Baldock. Is the applicant on the line? Uh, yes, this is uh, Andrew Heidemann from Foursquare Design Studio here. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I don't have any uh, additional comments. Um, I appreciate uh, Melissa's time working with us on this one. Um, there's obviously a couple uh, minor um, revisions we'll make and we'll ensure those get included on the drawings and that the uh, contractor follows through with them. Um, and they're all obviously very reasonable. We don't have a problem doing them. And uh, other than that, um, yeah, we just, uh, we hope uh, you guys will take approval into consideration. Okay, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Mr. Heidemann? Yes. Thank you. All right, um, any public comment? No public comment and no callers. Okay, we will close public hearing. Commissioners, any questions, discussion, or a motion? Commissioner Jones. Uh, 
Oh, uh, apologies, I just forgot to put my hand down. Um, but I'll go ahead and do the project. Um, this a little different than the previous one. So, therefore, regarding 916 Aquin Avenue, I uh, move for approval with all staff recommendations. Commissioner Fitz. A second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Are there any other questions before I take the roll? Vice Chair, did you have a comment? Uh, no. Okay, very good. And here's the roll call. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Yes. Very good. That is conclusion of our project. However, do we have anything else, Ms. Ziegler? We do not, but we do know that our next meeting will be also virtual because the governor has given us that permission. So we will hear you all next month rather than see you. Okay, thank you again. I also wanna thank Metro IT. They are always so good with our electronics and techno. So again, commissioners, thank you and staff, um, you're awesome. So have a good evening, everyone. Be safe, wear your mask, and do your social distancing. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.